Hello YouTube, this is Matt Pullen, and this video is going to be about the Benko Gambit 5F3 variation. So, I'll start out uh, d4, c4, and black plays knight f6, c5. And after uh, white you know, grabs the space in the center with d5, uh, black plays b5, which is the Benko Gambit. And uh, say white accepts the Benko Gambit, takes the pawn on b5, then black plays a6. And the uh, move that uh, this video is about is pawn to f3. Now this uh, this move looks uh, kind of silly, but is uh, is important to know something about this line. If uh, you know if you play the uh, the Banco Gambit, or is is interesting if you're looking for alternatives to the main lines in the Banco Gambit. So uh, I figured I'd you know give this some uh, some coverage. I mean the the point of f3. I mean it, it looks it looks really odd to play play your pawn on f3 before your e pawn has moved, but and also before any uh, any white pieces are developed. But the idea, I mean, just to put the pawn on f3 and then put the pawn on e4, uh, you have to understand in the main uh, lines of the Benko gambit, it's difficult for white to achieve pawn to, f, uh, pawn to e4 without making some concession. Uh, for instance, say instead of f3, white were to capture this pawn on a6, and the main line goes uh, g6, knight c3. Now, white is preparing to put the pawn on e4. So, uh, black captures with the bishop. And if white were to play e4, then black can exchange bishops on f1, and uh, white has lost the uh, privilege to castle. Now, uh, this isn't necessarily uh, worse for white. I mean, white can play this, and it does, uh, you know, occupy the center in the most efficient manner. And uh, white will then have to do something about his king, you know, either uh, fianchettoing the king with pawn to g3, king to g2. Or uh, sometimes he can play, you know, knight f3, h3, and then, you know, slowly walk his king up to h2 and then develop the rook. So it, it takes time for a white to achieve, you know, these maneuvers, though, you know, just to uh, just to get the king out of the center. So uh, you know, the main main Benko line uh, right now is uh, g3. You know, instead of moving the pawn to e4 right away, uh, white will you know fianchetto, he'll castle, he'll put the rook on e1, and then he'll play pawn e4. So. Uh, something something like this, and then if uh, if White were to just you know straight away uh, you know you know go and play for the pawn to e4 move, I don't know. Let's just say he castles and knight b6, rook e1. So now now that the e pawn is unpinned, White is going to play rook e4. I mean White is going to play pawn e4. So Black castles and then pawn e4. And then knight f d7, and this is a position where, although white has you know made the most obvious moves to support his plan of putting the pawn on e4, uh, the pawn on e4 is not really uh, is not really helping white. You know, if, if anything, it's slowing down the diagonal for his bishop on g2. The square e5 is well under control, and black is going to uh, you know be playing with the knight to c4. And you know, getting some pressure on the long diagonal. And in general, in the Benko gambit, of course, Black wants to use the the open lines on the queen side. So, so why did I show you all that? Just to get you know, as a, pre, a uh, overview of you know how the main lines in the Benko go and how it's difficult for White to play his pawn to e4. So um, by playing f3, white hopes to play pawn to e4 next without any uh, preparation. So if uh, if black were to play a passive continuation, let's say g6, and then uh, or g6, and e4, d6, you know because uh, e5 becomes a concern, kicking the knight away. 
before it has somewhere meaningful to go. So d6, knight c3, uh, bishop g7, and now just capture on a6. And here, uh, white has a very solid uh, central structure. It's going to develop with you know moves like bishop b5, a4, oops, a4, knight e2, castles. So he's still he's still up the Benko pawn. I mean, black is going to get open lines on the queen side, but white is developing efficiently, and the center is solid. So he, uh, I don't know, black doesn't have as much value for the pawn here as he does in the normal lines. So instead of that approach, I'm going to talk about a couple different approaches for black. So one is, I think this is uh, considered to be the main line of, uh, of this, and definitely the, most con the more conservative choice for black is to just take the pawn on b5, recover the gambit pawn. And now white plays pawn to e4. So he's got the uh, he's got the solid chain in the center, and he's threatening to uh, take the uh, pawn on uh, b5. So queen a5 check, uh, you know, give the white king a check and guard the pawn simultaneously. And if if knight blocks on c3, then you know pawn to b4 creates a problem. So generally you only see uh, bishop d2 in this position, and then then black plays b4, you know, in order to take away the obvious developing squares. But because this pawn is pinned at the moment, white can play knight a3, and the knight is going to c4, which is a uh, is a is a very nice square where it blockades the uh, you know the black queenside pawns. So uh, there are two basically two moves here uh, that get played. You know, one is d6 and one is e6. d6 is a little more passive. It's generally uh, generally associated with playing, you know, that you know, gradual buildup, you know, g6, bishop, g7, castles, and you know, get the bishop on the long diagonal. Uh, you can also you can also play a d6 with the idea of playing, you know, you know, e6 right afterwards and trying to take on d5 before, you know, white, you know, organizes a strong defense of that square. But white, the white pieces, you know, after a move, you know, knight c4, and then, you know, whether the queen goes back to a7 or the queen goes back to d8, you know, white is going to play uh, bishop d3, knight e2, and, you know, maybe, uh, maybe black will play d e6, you know, forcing, uh, forcing white to do something about his pawn on d5. So, I don't know, something like d, um, you know, bishop d3, and e6, and white probably has to exchange this, and then, uh, I don't know, knight e2. And if, uh, you know, because, you know, the knight may be coming to f4 to try and clamp down on d5. So suppose, uh, suppose Black then plays d5 just to get that break in, you know, when it's still possible to do so. So, you know, captures and knight captures and I don't know, white just castles. So black uh, black is a little bit behind in development and uh, is is not too bad though. So that is uh, as a typical line of d6. E6 is, is a little more aggressive. You know, black aims to you know attack the white center right away. You know, before making any other um, developing moves. So after uh, knight c4, there's queen c7, and now white has to do something about the pawn on d5. So uh, if white were to take on e6. Uh, the rule of thumb in these situations, uh, you know, pawn recaptures, you know, which pawn do you take back with, usually is, is better to take, you know, towards the center with the outside pawn, you know, so that you have more pawns in the center. But this position is, is an exception. You know, you could, you could take on you know, F takes E, but then, I don't know, it's not clear what, you know, how black is going to solve the backward problem, you know, the, the pawn on the, the D file. You know, because moving it would weaken the, you know, the e6 square. And also the f file is not that useful with the pawn on f3. 
So, um, for these reasons, I think D takes E is a better move in this case. And there's a pretty clear plan of development for black. It's going to play bishop to e7, and then castles, and put the rook on d8. You know, especially after, like, knight c6, there's, you know, black can try and, uh, you know, maybe double on the d-file, because uh, white is not particularly strong in that area at the moment. Um, so, so yeah, but there's a bishop g Bishop to g5 seems more critical to, uh, you know, black is attacking with a pawn and a knight. White is going to remove the knight that attacks that square and also opening up uh, the d-file for his queen. So pawn takes pawn, and now if e takes d5, then I think just pawn to d6, blockading the pawn on d5. This, this seems pretty easy for black to play. He's going to play bishop e7 in castles. And, uh, you know, say, why can, it, why can take on f6? And this gives, you know, black some shattered pawns. But it does give uh, black the bishop pair as well. And this bishop on uh, f8, you know, could go to g7, or it might end up being effective on the h6 square. Who knows? And these, uh, the pawns, they are doubled, but they, they do defend, uh, you know, numerous squares in... Uh, black camp, and it is, is not difficult, you know, or it is not easy, rather, for white to take advantage of the pawns because the f file is closed. You know, can't, uh, you can't get a rook and, you know, start assailing these, uh, these pawns. You have to get some kind of a blockade going, you know, like maybe get a blockade on f5. You know, blockade the pawns, keep them from moving, and then attack them. But it's, it's difficult to achieve here because, uh, you know, this, the dark squares are so weak for, uh, for white. So, I, you know, this type of middle game, you know, I think would be, uh, it is dynamic, but I think quite okay for black. So, uh, bishop takes f6 is more important here. You know, eliminating the knight that defends uh, d5. So here black should take on c4. And uh, now... After a bishop takes c4, is, this is interesting because uh, it looks like black is just going to go up a piece. Like, say, after g takes f6. The, but then there's queen d5, threatening to take on uh, f7, which would lead to uh, maiden 4. After, you know, king d8, queen takes f6 check, bishop e7, queen takes h8. You know, etc., and also threatening uh, the rook on a8, which is loose. So this this looks pretty bad, but there's queen e5. This resource, you know, gives uh, gives a flight square to the black king. So if white takes on f7, it's not going to be mate, and it also threatens the pawn on b2, which is loose. Now, white can take the uh, rook on a8, and then black can take this. And in order to save the rook, white is to play uh, rook d1, and then there's queen c3 check, king f2, grab this bishop, white takes the knight, and then there's queen takes check, you know, to, uh, knight e2, and then queen a6. And this uh, this leads to a position where white, uh, white has the exchange, you know, rook for bishop, but black has... Uh, couple of uh, very dangerous looking uh, outside pass pawns. So it is uh, it's quite playable for black actually to allow that uh, queen d5 fork. But you know if, if uh, black is more conservative you can just play bishop a6 and it stops the uh, you know it stops the mate idea and stops the uh, it stops queen d5 because black can just take on uh, c4. And here, there's, uh, you know, g takes, uh, g takes f6 is threatened, and also bishop takes c4 is threatened, so white has two hanging pieces. So after a bishop takes a6, there's rook takes a6, and, you know, this position is uh, you know, clearly okay for black. 
So those are uh, so that is a way you know by playing e6 and queen c7. I feel that Black can you know get equality in the uh, you know in the b5 line. So let's um, see. Let's see here. So after f3, you know there's a you know, we looked at g6. We looked at a takes b5, which is a little more standard. Now let's look at e6. This is really direct. And uh, you know it's consistent with the lines of the Benko where I like, where you know instead of playing a quick uh, you know d6 g6 and finchetto, Black is playing e6 and trying to you know bust up the you know the white center right away. And I think this works particularly well against uh, pawn to f3 because it's not a quick developing move. So, in, in, or at the least, at the very least, it seems like a critical test of the f3 variation. So uh, let's let's look here at uh, you know what happens if uh, White plays pawn to e4, which is consistent with f3. Uh, see, aside from that, there you see um, you know you see d takes e6 sometimes, you know just eliminating the you know the liability the pawn on d5, you know and then f takes e6. You know, here there's uh, here there's no reason not to take into the center, you know, giving Black a you know potentially useful f file and giving Black some more center pawns to you know to, to play with and you know maybe occupy the center with uh, pawn to d5, and it, you know it helps Black's development. He's just going to play bishop e7 and castle kingside, and you know do something about the pawn on. Uh, B5 and get the queenside pieces out. It's uh, it's a very fluid uh, game for Black, but you do you do see that you know because it doesn't give uh, White a uh, you know a pawn center that he has to maintain. So after after E6, um, there's also Knight C3, but this doesn't really lead to anything. So after Pawn takes Pawn, Knight takes, uh, Black can just take on B5 here, and then if Bishop G5. You know, threatening to you know, shatter the pawns. There's queen a5 check, and here, you know, this is this uh, unpins the knight and prepares to take on d5. You know, afterwards, uh, black will be golden after like, you know, the knight comes out to c6, and you know, black develops. So the only good move here is for white to play bishop to d2, attacking the queen. And the only good move for black here is to put the queen back on d8. And uh, here, the only good move for white is to put the bishop back on g5. So potentially, we have a uh, you know a, a repetition of moves going on. Of course, if if black is not okay for the draw, I guess uh, instead of queen a5, black can just allow his pawns to be crippled and play like I don't know. Um, bishop to b7, and I don't know, can double these, and I don't know. It seems uh, it seems like this type of position should be okay for black. As well. I mean, it is is dynamic uh, in that the, uh, it, the the pawns are shattered, but black has the bishop pair. Sort of like that position we discussed earlier, but it's less it's less clear because uh, white, you know, white has. Uh, Control over you know the the d file and the, the d5 square, so and also like I said, do something about that pawn. Uh, so that that is a possibility for uh, you know for Black to play for the win against Knight c3. That's it. Seems like a kind of kind of a boring move if you're off essentially offering Black you know a, a draw by repetition a move six. So e4 is uh, e4 is definitely uh, definitely considered the uh, you know the main response to e6, and it used to be you know there's there's really only one line that gets played here, and that's uh, e takes d, and then e5, you know because uh, white white does not want to allow the you know the e file to become open, he wants to you know attack there and try and capture on. Uh, D5. You know, if if knight g8, then queen takes d5 would be very good. For uh, I 
I once uh, messed up my move order in the Banco and you know fell into a position very similar to this one. It was it was a different move order though. It was like with the with the five knight c three variation. But I allowed this kind of situation where you know I hit, the knight went back to g eight and then queen takes d five and this is very 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 difficult for uh, for Black to uh, you know get developed in that situation. I ended up losing that game. Um, but that aside, you know, for e five queen e seven. You know, pinning the pawn, and then queen two unpinning. So then black uh, black puts the knight back on g8, and now there's uh, knight c3. This is the fairly forced sequence, attacking d5. Uh, bishop to b7, knight h3 with the idea of coming to f4 and attacking d5 again, and then pawn to c4. This is an important move because this queen was sort of bottled up, which in turn bottles up these guys. But with pawn to c4, this frees up the queen to go to c5 or maybe b4, which then you know frees up these uh, you know kingside guys to come out, right? So here, uh, bishop to e3 is a standard move, you know, because Black would like to put the queen on c5 and then bring the knight to uh, e7 to defend this. So bishop to e3, you know, develops a piece and uh, takes away queen c5. So now, say, black uh, takes the pawn on b5, which uh, develops the rook on a8. So uh, white, white castles, you know, in order to uh, get another attack around the d file. But castling is, uh, is, really, uh, is really, really dangerous. You know, in the, in the Benko game, that because of all the queenside the space and lines that Black can open, and especially you know, got this pawn near your king, it's only defended by the knight, and your opponent's rook is attacking it. Very, very risky stuff. But look at Black's pieces. Black has to get active to take advantage of this. And we're following uh, we're following the game uh, Lalich versus Kalifman from 1997. And this uh, this is a game with a uh, you know now infamous queen sacrifice. So Khalifman played queen b4, you know, with the idea of letting these guys out. And then knight f4 came, attacking d5. And black played knight e7. And now here in the post mortem, uh, Lalich thought that uh, white should play queen to f2 in this position. But in the game, there is bishop to b6. And this has some, uh, you know, some cunning ideas behind it. We're you know, trying, you know, working on trapping the black queen on the queen side. And also takes away the d8 square from the black king. So black you know, has to worry about uh, possible checkmate combinations. So h5 is uh, seems like an economical move. I mean, Black is not getting castled anytime soon, so might as well bring the rook out to h6. You know, cover the, uh, the third rank. So now White um, attempted to sacrifice an exchange. You know, trying trying to get you know some some knights into the position. You know, maybe to give a check on c7. But. Uh, you know, after there, there are definitely <clears throat> definitely lines where the black queen is getting trapped because uh, you know, the queen right now has no squares that could go to. But here, um, Khalifman uh, you know, shot to the chess world with queen takes c3. Queen takes c3. Wow, just train queen for knight, and uh, you know, after pawn takes and. It takes the rook on d8, and the knight takes, and bishop takes. It, the compensation that black has for this, I mean, the, the white king on the queen side is very vulnerable to attack. Also, this pawn on a2, uh, black has a nice you know, rook on the a file and can develop the pieces. Everything is pointing to white's queen side. And uh, the, you know, with, with the pieces that have been traded, the uh, black king is actually quite safe. You know, in the center, you know, Black's going to put the bishop back, back on uh, e6. You know, blockading everything. Is uh, you know, is this a hundred percent sound? 
Um, maybe not, but uh, Bogdan Lelich, a strong uh, grandmaster, was not able to survive this position with the white pieces. And there have been numerous games in this line since th that game, and definitely if, if you find this interesting, there, you know, there's you know, plenty of games and uh, plenty of new moves found from both sides to, uh, you know, to research. But uh, that is a possible exciting line after e takes d5, e5, queen e7, queen e2. You know, the, uh, you know, the, the key idea here is to play, uh, you know, with the c4 and, you know, queen b4 ideas. And uh, the black queen can be sacrificed in order to, to exploit the uh, white king that is castled to the queen side. So there is uh, there's another idea here aside from the e takes d lines, and that is uh, pawn to c4. Now pawn to c4 this looks ludicrous at first. You know you're just dropping a pawn on a square where white can capture it while developing and you know reinforces uh, center squares. Uh, this idea. Uh, I'm not sure when it was first played, but it was played in uh, 2004 by a Serbian guy named Predojevic, and I can't find any earlier uh, games with this idea in the Benko, so we'll just, we'll just give the guy with the cool name credit for the idea. And uh, the idea behind the C4, and you know, as I'll show later, this is an idea that I've tried myself, is uh, simply to clear the C5 square. To uh, you know, to, to put the bishop on, and the queen comes to b6, and you know, because of all these pawns, you know, on the that have been advanced to the light squares, you know, especially as a consequence of the pawn to f3, this dark square diagonal is you know extremely weak, and if we were to get a bishop on this diagonal, not only are there possible tactics on f2, but the uh, the white king is going to have a hard time you know castling and getting into safety. But this does involve, you know, a sacrifice of additional material. So, uh, so let's say, I mean, you see D takes E again, you know, this this exchange in this position, D takes E, F takes E, and we'll look at this a little later because it gives White one more one less thing to worry about, you know, the pawn on D5 coming under attack. But probably, you know, the best is to play, uh, you know, not make that concession and. You'll play bishop takes. And then after a takes, bishop takes again. Now look, two extra pawns for white. But uh, after bishop to c5, and you know, we'll just cover uh, see we'll, we'll cover this this game, uh, Cypher versus Vajda in 2004. This this I think is a good strategy for white, just you know, you're going to have a position that is very defective. The dark squares are very weak. So you might as well, you know, take the material. So white takes both pawns, you know, by, t by capturing on the b5 instead of retreating. Let's say, uh, see, knight, knight c3, just developing. Um, bishop g5 has been seen before, but it's a horrific mistake because of uh, bishop, queen to b6 which uh, threatens the bishop and also threatens to capture twice on g1. So this would win a piece for, uh, for black. So definitely important to play knight c3 first. And then uh, bishop to b7. I'm just following the game that I mentioned earlier. Then knight g2, castles, bishop g5, queen b6, queen d2. And uh, here... Um, Black decided to, uh, you know, try to open the e-file, but then white played e5. So after knight e8, there's uh, a4, you know, overprotecting the b5 square. And then knight c7, this is a good move. You know, putting another piece threatening uh, b5, you know, also protecting this and possibly going to e6 to blockade the, the e-pawn. Uh, so then b4... See, white, white gave up a pawn because he really wants to get control over this diagonal back. So, uh, but he can't, he can't put the bishop on e3 here, and it's very hard to get a piece supporting that square. And I guess he didn't, he didn't feel like playing the knight to d1, so I guess he just gave up the b pawn 
you know, he's, he's all, what's up, what's up two pawns, so, you know, he gives one of them back, he still has the, you know, the pawn, the A pawn, and now bishop to e3, queen a5, so now white has, you know, gotten control back over, you know, the, this diagonal, and, but, you know, black simply re relocated his dark square pieces to, uh, to this diagonal. So white castles and then uh, knight c6, and this is a position where it is is not clear that white has any advantage here. Is uh, I don't know, say say white plays uh, you know f4, black can just you know try and break up the center further with d6. And my my instinct here is that uh, I I don't know if I I don't know if I 100% trust uh, black's position, but I. I don't see anything. I don't see anything uh, wrong with it, um, aside from the fact that you know black is uh, still. Uh, st hmm. Huh. I mean, yeah. It looks this uh, this scene type of continuation seems okay, and is uh, is more fun for uh, black to play than white, I guess, because. You know, black is trying to actively break up the center, and there's no, there's not really any kingside attack for white, even though there, you know, there are no pieces over here defending the black king. So I, I would say, yeah, it's, I'd say this is worth playing for, uh, for black. So and that's that's uh, supposedly the best line, the line where white takes both pawns, but then gives one of them back. Hmm. I think I just confused myself talking about that line. Uh, anyway, let's go to the uh, to the original game where uh, uh, you know Jacob against uh, Predojevic in 2004. In that game, White uh, decided to retreat to b3, you know, which you know helps him keep an eye on d5, I guess. But it's not it doesn't take the uh, additional pawn on b5. And already, you know, since with the bishop going on c5, you can argue that there's already you know compensation for the pawn. So um, here, I mean, uh, Jacob tried uh, you know, King F1, you know, with the idea of uh, fianchettoing the king, but this this didn't turn out too well. Um, a more logical move would be Knight E2, simply leaving the king in the center for now. So then, you know, the game might go something like Queen B6, Knight B3, uh, Bishop E7, Bishop G5, and castles. This is the kind of position that you'd have to be okay with uh, for black to, uh, you know, to play this gambit. But I think that there are definitely, you know, some problems to solve for white since his king is trapped in the center. And at any moment, black may, you know, try to open the position by taking on d5. So, um, so Jacob tried king f1 and. I don't know how much commentary I'm going to give on this game because it's pretty ugly. I mean, he, uh, he's taking this tempo to, uh, you know, to move his king over to the king side before developing anything. But, it, you know, black uh, succeeds in opening the e-file. And then, uh, you know, rook e8, and 7 and look at this. You know, because these pieces were unmoved, black has the room to play rook a7 and then double before developing any of his queen side. So this, I don't know, this is this was not pretty. Um, bishop goes back to a7. This allows the queen actually to come to b6, and then there might be some some infiltration issues. Anyway, this is yeah. Um, so yeah, this was uh, a good advertisement for this gambit because uh, uh, Black was able to win in spectacular fashion. Uh, G5, uh, G5 checkmate. So, so yeah, that's uh, you know don't uh, don't spend a bunch of moves you know getting your king over to the king side when your opponent can still open the center and take advantage of your lack of development. I guess that's the lesson to learn from that game. Um, so anyway, fi uh, final game in this line, you know after. Uh, Instead of uh, instead of taking the pawn right away, you see D takes E6 and F takes E6, 
And I think, you know, the positional benefits of being able to play F takes E6 at this point, you know, I think uh, are very good for, uh, very good for Black, you know, because, uh, you know, he can always, like, try and occupy the center with pawn to D5, you know, given the time. And, you know, he can put the bishop on E7, which, uh, you know, watches some important queenside squares, you know, and also just allows castling and... And Black, Black's, uh, Black's position, I think, is very fundamentally sound. He's going to play, like, uh, bishop b7, and then maybe after taking this, play knight to a6. And, uh, see, let's go to a game that I played last year in this, uh, in this line um, against uh, Seth uh, Kuczynski. And I, I had the opportunity to try this line, you know, that I uh, just read about, the pawn to c4 idea. And uh, here, if, a, if bishop to e3, you know, preventing the black bishop from going to c5, then there's just a takes b, and you know, this has to be very pleasant for black. So, uh, bishop takes c4, and then a takes b, and I believe, even, even with the exchange of pawns, in this situation, I believe it has to be best for uh, black to grab the additional pawn on b5. But my pawn played bishop b3, and then I played the bishop to c5, and then bishop g5, and queen to uh, b6. Well, queen to b6 doesn't win a, pawn, win a uh, piece here, because there's no bishop on b5, but it's still a good move forcing white to do something about this knight and probably uh, probably knight e2 is uh, you know the move to play here but uh, knight h3 you know another way of developing the knight and I canceled here to uh, you know get the rook on the half open f file and uh, you know protect the knight and here my opponent played a move which is dubious um, he played bishop to h4 and better here might have been knight to c3, you know, because knight to c6, queen d2, you know, it's just a sample of what might happen here. h6, and the bishop retreats, and then d5. So with the king still in the center, black wants to punch open this, the, uh, you know, try and punch open some of the central files. So uh, knight to c3 is a good move. Also, e5 was possible. And here, uh, the computer likes uh, the computer likes knight e8, but I think I would have played uh, knight h5 because I want to uh, I want to keep the knight around the area of the, of the white king side because uh, because I, I feel that uh, I feel that black should be trying to attack in that sector of the board. And I play the bishop to b7, and I don't know, like uh, say. Um, you know, f4, bishop to b7, so, you know, counter threat on g2. This, uh, this seems like it would be fun to play for, uh, you know, for black. Anyway, that didn't happen. Um, my opponent played bishop h4, and his idea is he wants to, uh, you know, park the bishop on f2, you know, which blocks the line to g1, making it legal then for white to castle. And then once white is castled, I think uh, his position, you know, might be tenable. But what's the problem with uh, bishop to h4? Well, on uh, on g5, the bishop was covering the e3 square. And as it turns out, the c3 square is completely naked, and that turns out to be important. So bishop to b4, this, uh, this is a good move that I decided to play. Um, any other move would have resulted in a white advantage, actually, according to Houdini. But bishop to b4, with uh, with the idea that it makes a lot, it's a lot more powerful for the queen to go to e3 than for the bishop to go to e3, because from e3 the queen can do, you know, point in various directions and do evil stuff. Uh, so here. Here, what happened, uh, well, it's probably best for white to play king e2 here, just accepting the fact that uh, his king is going to remain in the center forever, you know, because this you know, stops, the, uh, stops the infiltration on uh, e3. So, anyway, after, like, knight c6 and bishop f2, bishop c5, 
you know, the bishop has done its job on b4, so then it goes back, you know, to, um, you know, to allow black to maintain control over that diagonal. And uh, this, this is the type of position, um, I guess, uh, white's still up upon here, but black has some pretty good activity. It's threatening, you know, there's always d5 trying to open the center with the white king there. And also maybe bishop a6, you know, with the idea of b4. Like, what, is, what white has to respect this idea as well. So, um, so that's king e2. Uh, knight d2 would have been very bad because of queen to uh, e3 check. And then after queen e2, uh, black could just win a piece by playing bishop takes, you know, because the queen is pinned. But instead, there's even better. Um, queen takes b3. And, uh, you know, the knight's pinned, so if white were to take this back, you know, take the queen on b3, then, you know, he loses both of his rooks, and uh, clearly black is better. So, uh, instead, knight c3 was played, and this still, this still might be, ten even though white has made some mistakes, this still might be tenable, because after queen e3, he can play king f1. And uh, this is still a game of chess after knight takes e4, taking advantage of the, you know, the uh, pin on the f3 pawn. White looks kind of disorganized, and this king is going to be in uh, trouble for, you know, basically the rest of the game. But, uh, I mean, I guess uh, the material here is, uh, is, the material here is even, actually, and... Uh, it's definitely uh, Black's opening gambit is a success uh, because White, uh, White is clearly uncomfortable in this position. With his uh, basically his kingside rook is out of play, and Black uh, Black has the center pawns, and he's he can just develop his queen side, and he'll come he'll come after the uh, the White King. Um, so king f1 was the last, really the last chance for white to stay in the game. And queen e2, and this, uh, this is actually a blunder because uh, of the you know, hanging rook on a1. So I, I took on c3, and uh, my opponent took back, and I took on c3. And so this is a fork. And the only, uh, the only way to save the uh, rook on a1 is to get the king off the back rank so that the rooks protect each other. So king f2 is forced, and now uh, queen d4, and again, the black, uh, black's queen is attacking the rook, so white cannot go back to the back rank because that cuts off the communication you know, between his rooks. And if he plays uh, queen e3, then there's uh, knight to uh, g4, you know, giving the fork and exploiting the pin on the f3 pawn. So uh, king to g3 was played, you know, and then the next move uh, is queen to e5. So the, it's sort of like a staircase on the, the dark squares. You know, there's, uh, the king was on e1, and there's queen c3 check, then the king went to f2, queen d4 check, king went to g3, queen e5 check. And in this position, uh, well, my opponent resigned in this position because uh, there is, uh, well, bad things are happening to white after, say, knight f4. There's, you know, check, which just wins a piece outright, taking advantage of the pin on the, uh, the knight on f4. And if uh, pawn to f4, well, I guess there's uh, knight takes e4 check, and then king to f3, and then just bishop to b7. And it's uh, very, very difficult for white to escape the litany of discovered attacks and pins that are happening in this position. So, and the only other move is really um, king f2. But then, uh, then there's uh, knight e4 might work as well. But there's uh, knight g4, that's the most obvious move I see. 
you know, taking uh, taking away the e3 and f2 squares. And this is pawn still pinned. So the black king has, or the white king rather, has to go to the back rank, and then this rook is dropping. So, I don't know, let's see. It's, er, king f2. I don't know, is this better? Like, what, what happens here after knight takes e4 if this, uh, if this happens? Hmm. Well, it does, oh, I guess, I guess there's just knight c3. And then take the queen. All right, so yeah, this would be decisive as well. So these, uh, these have been uh, some, some, uh, it's been an examination of the 5F3 line in the, uh, the Benko Gambit, you know, with the idea of uh, you know, setting up the solid center right away. And it might actually, uh, might actually pay off, but black should, uh, in, some, in some way or form, play E6 and challenge the white center before white is able to get his pieces off the back rank. That this is in really the way to exploit the... Uh, you know the early weakening of this diagonal, and if uh, if Black is able to uh, you know to get this position with the uh, you know with the pawn on uh, e4, then this move, this very interesting uh, you know line by uh, Predojevic, a secondary pawn sacrifice with c4, is well worth uh, is well worth looking into. is uh, is a newer idea. You know than the standard, uh, you know, e takes d, you know, lines, which uh, led to a, you know, a queen sacrifice, which has been heavily heavily analyzed since. But uh, if you don't want to go in for either of those sacrificial lines, then I guess uh, you know if you're black, there's always uh, a takes b5. This is a uh, is a very sound way to play. And it also involves uh, challenging the center with e6. So after, say, queen a5 and e6, so is a is a more conservative way to play for uh, for black. But it still it still keeps the theme of you know breaking apart the the white center at an early stage. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I don't know. That was that was closer to a rant than a, than a lesson. But uh, you know, the five the five F three line is is important to know something about. You know, because even though it looks like uh, what White is doing is uh, not fundamentally sound, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of moves like that, if you don't know the uh, principles to apply in dealing with them, you know, can uh, can end up, you know, you know, with your opponent getting a uh, satisfactory position. So, uh, thank you for watching this. Jeez, how long is this? We're almost at uh, 3,000 seconds. So, uh, take care.